Um, I'd like to say, first of all, thanks for the invitation to speak today, and thanks also um, for the invitation to come last night as well. It's been really inspiring to hear talks from Chris and Michelle and Amy this morning, and uh, a lot of kind of food for thought from my side, really. And um, I've met some lovely people, Jane and Alan here as well, the nicest people you can ever meet, I think. And, uh, uh, Alan was looking after his four grandsons the last couple of days, and that's more impressive than anything else I've heard um, <laughs> during this, uh, during this uh, meeting. So, I've been asked to talk to you about um, scans for patients with melanoma. Um, I'm a radiologist with a, an interest in oncology imaging, so I'm the reason you're not getting your scan reports, because I'm here today. Um, <laughs> But also, I uh, do a lot of interventional radiology, so I'm the one responsible for sticking needles into you for liver biopsies and node biopsies and FNAs and things like that, really. Um, so I spend an awful lot of my time um, dealing with patients with melanoma, but also uh, other cancers as well. Um, it's very temperamental, isn't it? There we go. So hopefully by the end of my talk, um, we'll have looked at how imaging relates to the staging of melanoma, which Howard touched on in his talk as well. Um, look at some of the advantages and disadvantages of different imaging modalities, including plain film radiography, um, what's re what, what we refer to as radiography, um, commonly referred to as x-rays, um, ultrasound imaging in CT and MRI scans as well. Dear me. Last one, please. <laughs> Um, and then at the end of my presentation, I want to touch on um, just a couple of points for discussion, really. So something we touched on previously, and I think um, Michelle touched on this morning about um, how long we should continue to scan for and the concept of scan anxiety, and, um, and why does radiation dose matter? So I'm sure you're all familiar with the melanoma staging. Um, so stages zero, one, and two are what we consider to be localized disease in stages three and four when it spreads to either lymph nodes or, or other organs. And this has a bearing on how we image our patients. And this document, um, pr produced by Melanoma Focus, sums it up quite nicely. And you can see from the table here, um, as the stage increases and the risk level increases in patients, so too does the intensity of the imaging uh, regime that that patient undergoes. And you can see that those patients with um, the high stage threes and stage four disease, and particularly those on systemic therapy, um, we're subjecting these patients to um, you know, lots of CT scans in a relatively short interval, um, and they can soon be having kind of 26, 27, 28 CT scans in, in just, a, just a few short years. Um, and we'll touch on why that might matter later on. So first of all, we're going to look at plain film radiography or x-rays. Um, so this is a relatively cheap test, um, which the NHS likes. It does carry with it a, a degree of a, a dose of radiation, albeit very um, quite small. And I'm sure many of you had chest X-rays and stood in front of an X-ray camera like this on the screen. It's obviously very accessible, which um, patients like. You may be able to get this at your local GP practice or your minor injuries unit, rather than, rather than having to travel the 60 miles to Leeds teaching hospitals to then pay 12 pounds for parking and then drive the 60 miles home. Um, but how useful is it? Well, it can be very useful. So this is a, a patient of ours um, with melanoma, and he was complaining of pain in his forearm. And I'm sure, hopefully, some of you can appreciate that there's this small lucency, a bit of a, a hole in the ulna, which is one of the bones in the forearm, and that was causing him some bother. We then did an MRI scan, which we didn't really need, to be honest, but we like to do more imaging than is necessary in Leeds. Um, <laughs> And that showed the melanoma deposit um, in M MRI as well. And the patient was referred on to uh, our orthopedic colleagues. Um, they popped the plate across it to reduce the, ri the risk of it fracturing. And then I think he went on to have radiotherapy to, to that area. So in this case, the X-ray is very, very useful. However, it doesn't always um, pick up the deposits in the bone. Is there just a lag? Is that a problem? Yeah, so I just need to be more patient. Okay. Um, so this is a 25-year-old a, a female, actually, and she didn't have a diagnosis of melanoma. Um, she was a very keen netball player, um, and she was complaining of pain in her lower leg, just below her knee, when she was playing netball. And perhaps some of the eagle-eyed amongst you will notice that the texture of the bone on the x-ray but beneath the knee is just a little bit patchy, but there's not an awful lot to see. But she had an MRI scan just a week later, and that demonstrated a large tumour in, in her knee. And um, this turned out to be 
a nasty tumour called a sarcoma. And she also had other deposits in, in the femurs as well, which we couldn't spot on, on the X-ray. And we know from studies in, in animal bones um, where um, some uh, people with more time on their hands have hollowed out bones and then X-rayed them afterwards. We know that you need to lose about roughly half of the bone density before we often see it on X-ray. And so you need, you need quite a large deposit in that bone to be able to see it. So perhaps it's not, not the best test in, in, in these situations. Moving on to ultrasound now. Oh, sorry, we've got another x-ray. Um, and this is a patient who's complaining of a cough um, for, for some months. Um, and again, some of you might spot there's a small uh, nodule just behind the heart here, but that can be tricky to see. And obviously that's much easier to see on, on, the, on the CT scan. And this turned out to be a, a different type of tumor called a carcinoid or a neuroendocrine tumor. So again, we know that um, chest x-rays aren't always uh, useful for picking up small deposits in the lung. And in that situation, CT scans tend to be better. Moving on to ultrasound imaging. So I'm sure many of you are familiar with ultrasound for antenatal care, um, scanning in pregnancy, but we use it for an awful lot of other things as well. Um, it's a little bit more expensive than x-ray. It relies on a specialist sonographer or a radiologist to do the scan, but it carries with it no radiation. It just uses sound waves, as the name suggests. Again, it's uh, pretty, pretty accessible. Um, a lot of GP practices now offer some ultrasound services, certainly in district hospitals as well. And in the right setting, it can be very useful. This is a patient, a 60-year-old man, um, with a stage 3 melanoma. And as part of his um, melanoma workup, he had his CT scan, which um, spotted the lymph node um, in the right side of his neck, highlighted by the arrow, just over there. And then he came for an ultrasound um, a few days later, and we spotted that on the ultrasound as well. Um, the node was about six millimeters, and we were able to pop a small needle in um, to take some cells off, confirm that there was melanoma present, and then that, you know, the patient can be, can be treated um, appropriately. We also use it um, to assess the abdominal organs. This is a young female patient who came having picked up a, a, um, an abnormality in her liver on a CT scan. And uh, between the calipers there, there's a, a, a bright area in the liver but we can give uh, an injection of, uh, like when you have a CT scan, um, the contrast, we can use that for a different type of contrast agent for ultrasound as well. And hopefully, if I scroll through some of these images. So here we've got the, um, the kidney here taking up some contrast, and then if I keep flicking through the images, hopefully you'll see the contrast come into the liver as well. And we can use contrast ultrasound to characterize liver lesions, and it can avoid um, further scans such as MRI or even a biopsy in some patients too. Are you able to scroll forward for me? It should be like a cine loop, but it uh, seems to be a bit of a lag with it. So you can start to see the contrast coming into the liver there and into the blood vessels in the liver. And soon you'll see a hole appearing um, within the liver as well. And that, that corresponds to the, um, the small abnormality that we saw on the, on the ultrasound. There we go. And this is quite a useful test. Um, typically contrast ultrasound is, isn't, isn't offered in, in smaller hospitals. It tends to be something, you can see the hole appearing there now um, within the liver. And this is, this is a benign collection of blood vessels called a, a hemangioma. So nothing more needs doing with that. The patient doesn't need a biopsy, um, doesn't need any, any further imaging such as an MRI scan. We can safely put that to bed. Um, and um, make, and uh, we use it quite often in, in leads. Can you skip to the next slide, please? Oh. <laughs> Not just you having the problems. Then. We'll just give it a second to catch up. And we, if, if this turned out to be something that we were worried about on the contrast ultrasound as well, we could then perform a biopsy at the same time. Um, it's kind of like a one-stop shop, really. Um, and again, for patients in Leeds, we, uh, Howard and the team take referrals from as far east as Scarborough and up, up to Newcastle and, and down to Nottingham. Um, so patients often travel a, a large distance for their clinic appointments, radiology investigations, etc. cetera. Um, so it, it's, if we can offer... Um, kind of a one-stop shop service for imaging and biopsy, then it's obviously better for them. <clears throat> so
So ultrasound um, is best used when there's a very specific question. Um, so for example, in a patient who's had groin surgery, um, Howard might send me a patient asking if it's scar tissue that they can feel in the groin or if there's any, any lymph nodes there that we need to um, you know, pay more attention to. Or if a patient's noticed a lump in their groin or under the armpit, then that can be very useful to assess with ultrasound. And again, we can pop a needle in if needs be. Where it's less useful is looking at the bowel and, and um, it doesn't, look, doesn't penetrate through gas very well. Um, and also it doesn't, it's not very good at surveying a large area. So I wouldn't, for example, um, want to be surveying um, the whole of a, a patient's back with ultrasound because um, it, it's, it's best used when it focuses on a small area, if that makes sense. CT scanning is um, obviously the kind of workhorse of oncology imaging. We use it in the staging um, for a lot of cancers, including melanoma. And also for the follow-up as well. Yeah. Uh, I have to say, we, our radiologists just laugh when I say we might be doing this. We're, we're very fortunate in that Howard and, and the, the MDT team are very protective of our radiology services, mainly because we're, we're so under the cosh. Uh, thank you. Um, and you know, I, I, I don't reject referrals because I think if, if, if they're requesting an ultrasound or a CT, then it's indicated. But I know that we, we can't. Um, I think Howard probably talk to that better, yeah. And um, it's, it's, the, it's, the, um, it's probably the worst kept secret in medicine. The ultrasound's actually dead easy. So, um, so moving on to CT imaging, as I said, it's the workhorse of, of uh, oncology imaging. Um, we obviously do an awful lot of it, and it's increasing year on year. Um, it relies on, obviously, very expensive kit, um, and it relies on specialist staff um, to operate that kit. So it comes at some cost, and um, obviously it involves uh, ionizing radiation. It's essentially an x-ray camera spinning around the patient at some speed. Um, so the radiation dose is not insignificant, although obviously as technology improves, the radiation dose is improving all the time as well. It's readily accessible now. Um, obviously, um, I think pretty much all district hospitals have CT scanners, and then there's a move um, from the government to move to the, towards these regional diagnostic centers um, to take imaging closer to patients rather than have them having to travel into teaching hospitals, et cetera. And, um, and it's very, very useful. So here we can see that it can pick up um, brain metastases in this patient here. It can pick up um, disease in the abdomen, in the liver, and in the bladder in this patient with, with extensive stage four melanoma. And also we can use it to guide our biopsies and drainage procedures as well. For example, taking a biopsy of this, um, this lung nodule in a patient um, with malignancy. Um, it can also obviously be used extensively in follow-up imaging as well. So there's a large deposit in the lung here, and uh, we can follow this up after cycles of um, pembrolizumab, and see, we can see that this um, deposit shrinks over time. But the downsides of it are obviously the radiation dose, um, the contrast as well, and um, it doesn't image the, it's not quite as sensitive to image the brain and the spine and other organs compared to MRI scanning. Um, the MRI and the CT scan look, look pretty similar, um, but those of you who have been into the MRI scanner will know it's much noisier. The scans take much longer, so you're looking at roughly an hour in the scanner compared to maybe 10 minutes for a CT scan, and it's not as accessible as CT scanning either. Although most district hospitals might have them, um, you'll typically have to travel for that, and certainly it won't be available in, in primary care centers or minor, inj minor injury units. Um, but it is very useful in assessing the brain and the spine, as I hopefully I'll show you now. This is a patient um, complaining of back pain, and um, you can probably see that there's some 
a bit of irregularity in the in the thoracic spine on the CT scan, but we could put that down to wear and tear in a patient of you know get, getting on in their years. But the MRI scan in the same patient shows that there's um, marrow replacement. Can we go back? Thank you. Um, MRI scan shows that there's um, a deposit in the in the spine there, causing their symptoms. He was complaining of tingling in his in his hands, um, and he went on to have radiotherapy to good effect for that. So MRI is much more sensitive for picking up these deposits in the spine. And similarly, in this case as well, this patient was complaining of, um, next slide, please, uh, weakness in their, in, and numbness in their uh, lower limbs. And there's a deposit here um, in the spine, pressing on the spinal cord. Um, and the patient went on to um, see the spinal surgeons for this to be resected. We, as, as we discussed previously, um, MRI scanning in the brain is, m is more sensitive than CT scan. You can appreciate that small dot on the CT scan on the left of the screen there, but I'm sure you can appreciate it's much easier to see uh, on the MRI scan. So we can pick up smaller deposits in the brain on MRI, but we need to factor that in, that in with accessibility for the patients, the length of time to scan, and um, whether they do have any cardiac devices, for example. And it can also be used to characterize liver lesions as well. So if we do pick up a liver lesion on, on a CT scan, um, we can do an MRI scan that gives us further information about that and hopefully avoid a biopsy. Um, and these are different types of liver lesions that we can pick up on, on MRI. So it gives us a bit more information without having to biopsy everything that we see. Um, finally, moving on to nuclear medicine imaging. Uh, this is a picture of a PET CT scanner on the screen. It looks very similar to your standard CT. Um, but it comes at greater cost. Um, similar radiation doses now as, as the technology has improved, um, but it's the accessibility for PET-CT, which is the main issue currently. Um, these are typically available in, in large teaching hospitals or, or, or large district hospitals, so patients do have to travel for these. Um, and we use it largely as a troubleshooting um, scanning technique in Leeds for patients where we think it will add value. For example, in this case here, we spotted this um, lung nodule on a, on a regular CT scan, we thought this might have been either infection or tumor. So we did a, a PET CT scan. And a PET CT scan is very similar to a CT scan, but it's got a different kind of type of camera bolted to it as well. And we give the patient an in, injection of a tracer, and that tracer is taken up by tissues which use a lot of glucose. So for example, the brain, the liver, the heart, um, are all metabolizing glucose all the time. But other tissues which are gonna use a lot of glucose, including um, cancer tissues are also going to take up that tracer as well. And you can see here how the, um, how the uh, lung nodule has taken up uh, the tracer in keeping with um, a tumor, but it's also picked up um, some mediastinal nodes. So you've also got lymph glands around the heart as well, and it's picked up a deposit in the bowel as well. Um, and the patient had an unexplained anemia. He was uh, tired and losing weight, and there was a deposit in the bowel from his melanoma. So the patient was able to go on to have resection of that um, to imp improve his symptoms. Next slide, please. And this is a different type of uh, nuclear medicine scan. This is called a, a bone scan or bone scintigraphy. Again, a, a trace is injected into the patient, but this time the trace is taken up by, um, by the bone, and particularly where bone is turning over a lot. So if a patient's had a fracture, or if they've got arthritis, they'll see, you'll see areas on the bone scan that light up, but it also um, takes up um, Bone deposits also take up tracer as well. And this is a, a patient um, with prostate cancer. On the chest x-ray, it looks relatively normal. You'd say that maybe the skeleton looks a little bit dense, but actually um, he's got, he's got um, quite extensive um, bone disease, which can only be picked up on, on the bone scan, really. And these are, these are all deposits on, it, on his bone scan. And the patient can obviously be offered um, the appropriate treatment and it also be followed up with bone scan as well. And as the treatment, as, as he responds to treatment, um, the degree of uptake on the bone scan will improve as well. So we can use it as a, a follow-up test as well. So as I come to the end of my talk, I want to touch on some kind of points for discussion really. Um, and I think we've talked about some of them earlier on as well. Um, the first thing is the concept of scanxiety, um, as, as we talked about um, before. And this is the anxiety associated with cancer detecting scans. I'm sure that many of you have been on, been on this um, journey. I, I can't say journey. What do we say? Story. Experience. Okay. Um, been on this experience. Um, we'll, we'll be fully aware of this. And particularly with those patients who are having scans every three or four months, um, I'm sure in the calendar you, you know about the, sc the, next, the scan that's next 
due to be coming up and then coming up to scan day and then waiting you know, three, possibly four weeks for, for your scan results only to do the same thing again two or three months down the line. It must, be, um, it must feel like a constant merry-go-round, merry really. Um, but equally, I think we need to be aware of those patients who are coming to the other end of their, of their journey um, experience. <laughs> um, and this is a quote from a patient which I took from a paper. Sorry, you can go back. Um, yeah, who's, who was coming to the end of their surveillance program. And they were getting some anxiety about the, um, the fact that their surveillance was coming to an end. And I think we as clinicians need to be mindful of that and also kind of be aware of both sides of the seesaw, really. And um, I wouldn't be a radiologist if I didn't um, say something about radiation and, and why it matters. Well, we know that radiation is harmful, but a lot of the information we have about radiation um, harming people comes from um, large population-based studies, and a lot of these come from um, catastrophic nuclear events, including the atomic bomb, um, nuclear power station um, catastrophes, and things like this. And clearly, to infer huge population-based studies from catastrophic nuclear events down to um, patients undergoing CT scans is, is quite a leap, really. But we know that some patients are more susceptible to radiation than others, particularly um, women and children, because of the, um, they have more susceptible tissues in their body, including um, breast tissue, um, growing tissues particularly, um, gonads and thyroid, for example. And we also know that CT scans in particular carry a significant radiation dose. So a CT scan of the abdomen and pelvis is the equivalent of roughly 200 chest X-rays. And it, one CT head is roughly 18 months of background radiation. But these population-based studies have follow-up often 10, 20, 30 years. And so how do we take this um, population, this kind of long-term population data and apply it to um, the patients who are coming for CT scans? Well, again, Melanoma Focus have um, issued some quite useful guidance on this, which I've um, lifted. And they, they've tried to put things in, into perspective for um, not just um, melanoma patients, but um, all people undergoing scans. And they, as I'm sure many of you know, one in two of us will be um, affected by cancer in our lifetimes. So that gives us a 50% risk during our life. Um, and to put that into perspective, a CT, a thorax, abdomen, and pelvis gives you a 0.1% risk of a, a lifetime risk of cancer. So the actual risk associated with the CT scan is very small. Um, and this table at the bottom here is an example of a 45-year-old man who's undergone 15 CT scans over five years. And they've calculated that would give that, that, that patient a 1.5% increased risk of cancer over his lifetime. And so that needs to be taken into, account, into perspective um, with an underlying cancer diagnosis as well. But I think my main concern as a radiologist at the moment is in the context of um, those patients who have, undergone, who, who have had systemic therapy, have had a fantastic complete response, and then we're following them up um, almost indefinitely. And it's how we, how we deal with that going forward, really. At what point do we say, well, maybe we need to look, look at MRI scanning um, instead? And I think we've had those discussions in our, in our local MDT, and we do offer MRI surveillance um, currently for a small number of patients, um, but I think we'll probably move, move, move more towards that with, with one eye on, on cumulative kind of radiation dose in the future. Um, so just a few take home messages. Hopefully I've shown you that um, different imaging studies have both advantages and disadvantages. Um, cost, the radiation dose, the accessibility and the utility all play a part in, in our clinical decision making as to what investigation might be best um, for you going, undergoing um, radiology investigations. And the more, more information you can give to your clinician, um, that hopefully they will then pass that information on to me, um, along with your past medical history, your scan history, and, and you know, where you live, so, so you know, in terms of accessibility to kind of PET CT scans and MRI, et cetera, um, to consider what imaging investigation is the next best test. And perhaps most importantly, um, if your symptoms of back pain or headaches or abdominal pain persist despite having a, a recent normal or negative test, um, then do let your clinical team know, because it may be that we need to have a conversation about um, whether we need to take that, take that um, any further forward. Thank you.